Trevor so much for that lovely introduction. And also thank you, Ashu, and everybody at eGain for all of your hospitality and generosity and the chance to speak with all of you today. So today, we're going to be talking about the effortless experience. And certainly, as I have worked with executives around the world around the topic of customer loyalty, what's so interesting to me is that oftentimes, it's not the metrics, it's not the, the data, but it's the stories. It's the customer stories that really invigorate and drive people, because it is our customers' stories and their experiences, the things that resonate with them enough to share with their peers and colleagues, these are things that build our customer brand. So I thought today I'd start with a story of myself, a story about this giraffe. So this little giraffe here, Joshi, he is the favorite best friend of a little boy named Timmy. And Timmy and his family live in Florida. So they live in Orlando. Timmy and his family went on a great vacation to the Ritz-Carlton down in the Florida Keys. So Timmy, Joshi, and his family had a great time. They come back home, and Timmy is horrified. Joshi's missing. Where is he? And of course, you know, like any other small child, he has an epic meltdown right before bedtime. So of course, his parents, also exhausted from the trip, do what any good parent does, which is they told a little white lie. They said, no, 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 Joshi's not actually lost. He just wanted to take an extended vacation. So he stayed back at the Ritz-Carlton a few days. He needed a little break from us. You'll see him in a few days. So Timmy placated, goes off to bed. Meanwhile, the mother is frantically online looking for replacement Joshi with expedited shipping. And the father is looking through all the luggage. Maybe, maybe Joshi's in there. But luckily for them, Joshi had been found. They got a call from the Ritz-Carlton. The manager said, oh, we actually found Joshi for you. And the parents are overjoyed. They said, thank you so much. Could you ship him back? Of course. And in there, in there just ex being so ecstatic that they actually did was they admitted to the little lie they had told their son. They said, you know, we actually had told, Josh told Timmy that Joshi was on this extended vacation. So, so glad to have it back. Now, what the manager of the Ritz-Carlton did next was not what we typically would see, somebody who just would pack up Joshi and send him off. You know, he took it one step further. And he decided to document <laughs> Joshi's extended vacation. So here's Joshi. He's uh, enjoying the rays, getting a, a nice massage with those requisite cucumber slices on the eyes. He made some new friends. And he looks like he took a joyride on the beach there. I mean, Joshi had a better vacation than I did this year, personally. So they, what they did was they actually put this in a nice little book shipped it back with Joshi, and for good measure, a bunch of Ritz-Carlton swag. Of course, when, the, when Timmy opened up the package, all he cared about was Joshi, but his parents were overjoyed. They had kind of, the Ritz-Carlton had sort of followed up on the story and presented this to them. And it turned out, just by happenstance, that the father actually was a blogger for the Huffington Post. So, of course, he blogged about this, and this thing went viral. Everybody started talking about Joshi and, these, and the, the, what really the Ritz-Carlton did to go above and beyond to have that moment of wow for the, its customer. And we started getting a lot of calls, too. Our clients saying, how do we get this? I may just be a bank, a manufacturing company, but how do I get this all the time, consistently, for all of my customers? And so, as we do, we really go on behalf of our clients to do the research to understand how do we do this, and how do we do this in a way that doesn't cost us millions and millions of dollars. And there were three big questions that guided our research. Number one is, we wanted to see the impact that customer service has on a customer's future loyalty. So there are a lot of things that can drive loyalty, right? Your product, your price, your brand, reputation, et cetera. But what's the role of service? Number two, what are the things we can do that can drive loyalty? What are the things that matter and matter enough to our customers? And very importantly, how can we actually improve loyalty within service while still reducing operating costs? 
we are still largely a cost operation. So any multi-million dollar solution may just have to wait. So these are the three questions that come up and the conclusions of which are in our book, The Effortless Experience. It represents five to over five years of research that we've done on the topic and that we continue to do on behalf of our clients every day. And it's the thing I want to talk about here is a little bit about loyalty, right? Loyalty typically has three dimensions. Some of them may be more or less important to you. Number one is, of course, repurchase. These people are buying again. Two, share of wallet, buying more. And three, very interestingly, we talked a lot about social already this morning, that word of mouth, both positive and we'll talk about in a second, negative word of mouth. And as I said before, there are a lot of things that drive loyalty, but really, we believe that the truest test of loyalty is when something goes wrong. After they've been purchased your product, after they've had a great experience with it, and something's broken, there's a question, there's a problem, this is the moment that is crucial for loyalty is a moment that we investigated. So all of the focus of our work looks at what happens when things don't go quite the way that we had planned them. And we took a look at this in a variety of different ways. And we are very quantitative in our approaches. We actually surveyed over 125,000 customers from around the globe, B2C, B2B, all different industries, all across the globe about their past service experiences what they went through, what happened for them, and more importantly, what they would do with their loyalty afterwards. So what was their loyalty outcome of all of this? We looked across, so across the multi-channels, the omni-channel experience that we talked about. We also surveyed over 5,000 frontline reps. We wanted to know, actually, what did they do? What are the activities? What's the support they have? What do they think of the environment they work in? What skills do they bring to the table? And lastly, we did an in-depth audit of over 100 companies, understanding their policies, processes, their measurement tools and techniques, their culture and climate, really trying to understand everything. And all of this leads us to three big findings I'm going to talk about today. And finding one, very interestingly, is that delight actually doesn't pay. So let's talk all about this for a while. This is what we thought we would find. What we thought that is if you could go from meeting customer expectations to exceeding them, you would actually see an exponential increase in customer loyalty. We thought that that was the payoff you would get, the Joshi experience. But what the 125,000 customers told us is actually something very different. What they told us in service experiences was the difference in between meeting versus exceeding their experiences in the service interaction, their loyalty was actually marginally impacted. There was no actual significant impact in their loyalty. There is no difference to them in terms of meeting versus exceeding. It's a really surprising finding to us, something that we spent a lot of time thinking about. Because, you know, I, sometimes I present this, a lot of folks go, well, yeah, Larry, I get it, but aren't expectations just in the eye of the beholder, aren't they just relative? No, they are, that's, that's true, but they are into a point. So you're all consumers, we all are consumers today. Put yourself in your consumer's shoes. It's seven o'clock, dinner's on the table and the family's waiting and you're on the phone with a cell phone provider, a mobile provider about your bill. What are the two things you wanna do? You want it to be solved and you wanna get back to your life as soon as possible. And that is what meeting your expectations means when something goes wrong. Two things. Thing one, it is solved. Thing two, I'm back to my life. I don't have to deal with this anymore. I can enjoy my time. And that's what meeting expectations means. Those things that we do to go above and beyond, the giveaway, this gift certificate, the expedited shipping, the additional thing, may feel good in the moment to us and to customers, but actually those people are no more loyal. And I have to think about Joshi's parents here. Do you think that they are loyal Ritz-Carlton users every time they take their family of four out for a vacation? Probably not. 
So in fact, what we say is that those lists that we see on the walls, all those great things that customers write to us are great. But I challenge you all to go back and look at that Hall of Fame and see, are those customers actually our most loyal? And I would guarantee you, I've been to many contact centers, we've looked at those letters, we've compared it to customer records, and they're just no more loyal than any other customer out there. Which in itself can be sort of a letdown, but there is a bit of a, a silver lining here. Thing one is, you know, delight actually is rare to happen. In fact, customers tell us this only happens 16% of the time. So very rarely are their expectations exceeded. And your peers tell us delight is costly. They say that it increases operating costs by 10 to 20%. It's those giveaways, it's the freebie, it's the waiving the fee, the expedited service. So all of those things are costing us, but they are not returning us in terms of more loyal customers. So if it's not delight, then, then really where does the role that we do play? Back to that, that question one. You know, and I think it's actually really interesting that we say that because, you know, when you think about the delight that customers have and that delighted thing, it's actually played out in very recently in some social research. So there are two, there are two researchers here, one from the UC system, U University of California, San Diego, and one from University of Chicago, who just wrote a, a, a paper that was published in this SPPS that's about promises. What they actually found was they did a bunch of experiments with individuals and promise keeping. So an individual actually promised to help another individual with a set of puzzles. I'll do 10 puzzles for you, and every puzzle you get, you get an extra dollar. So those who actually completed the 10 puzzles, everyone was, the other person was quite happy with. Those who actually completed less than the 10 they had promised, of course, unhappy. But there were some who completed 20, 30 puzzles on behalf of their peer, earning them more money. And they were actually no happier, they saw no more value from that person, and they were no more satisfied than the person who just did the 10 they had agreed on. Which goes to show just outside of the world of service and the world in general, people don't actually put a lot on exceeding our promises. They don't see more value coming out of it. So, it's very interesting that we see this play out in lots of different fields. Within service, though, we can figure out the role that we do play, and it turns out to be on a little bit of a different side of loyalty, a different coin. So if we take all the things that matter to your customers and the, all the things that matter enough to impact their loyalty, it's actually only a small handful of things out of the hundreds of things that could matter. When you add them all up, you get this, which is to say that customers have nearly a four times greater chance leaving a service interaction more disloyal as opposed to more loyal. And this isn't about the quality of your service, the quality of your people, but it's because they have a problem, the customer. They're coming to you with a problem, a question. They're coming to you in a negative state. And it is our job in service to recover that person, to be neutral, and we have a small of a chance to make them slightly happier. But if we don't ignore the negative piece of this puzzle, there is no way they will leave more loyal. They will leave more disloyal. So what does this negative pie, negative piece of the pie look like? Well, it's stuff that, as consumers yourself, are things I'm sure you've experienced, right? Having to call again, having to switch channels, go from one channel to another, still not getting resolution being transferred all around the company, repeating information, repeating yourself, that robotic service, it feels like they're just saying what they always say again and again and again. And the policies and processes that feel like they're just there to help the company, they're not there to help me. And just a general hassle factor, this thing actually is, just feels harder than it should be. All of these things, are things that I bet you can think about of happening it's you, for you as consumers. And I would have to wonder, if you gave a listen in to a call right now in your call center, how many of these things are happening for your customers right now? How many of your customers are actually going through this? Inadvertently, of course, but it does happen. And what we find is that all of these things together, when you add all of them up, it's all about customer effort. 
It's about how hard or how easy it is to do those two things I talked about, get it resolved, and get back to my life as quickly as possible. So what is this thing, customer effort? What will it get us? So we took a look at the business case for actually reducing customer effort. And some really great things happen when you can be a low effort organization. In fact, 94% of those who had low effort experiences said they would repurchase with the company. Compare that to only 4% with high effort. 88% said, I will actually do more business with this company because I had a low effort experience. And conversely, 81% said, I have spread negative word of mouth about a company because of a high effort experience. So overall, what we find is that when customers have high effort experiences, if a customer leaves an interaction with your service organization and says, wow, that was hard, 96% of them will become more disloyal. They'll be less likely to buy again, spend more, and much more likely to spread that negative word of mouth. You compare that to only 9% who said, I had an easy experience. And the imperative actually becomes so clear that really what we have to do is not have that customer with the thought bubble leaving, oh, I was so delighted, but wow, that was easy, or at least easier than I thought it would be. And you don't have to make everything effortless in terms of actual effort. We'll see, talk in a second about the perception of effort that matters even more than we thought it did. So, once we found this research, we were pretty intrigued and we wanted to know actually, what do low effort companies do? Because what people told us is that this isn't about an 180 degree change in my management strategies, but it's putting an effort lens on everything that we do. And it's really about seeing everything through, how much effort is this gonna cause the customer? And we find that there are four things that low effort companies do consistently and you'll see them here. We'll go through each of these in a bit more detail in the next 30 minutes here, but I just wanna start here and give you an overview. So thing one is channel stickiness on the top left. We find that that hopping from channel to channel, feeling like I've hit dead ends, all of that can be very high effort for a customer. In fact, every channel switch is correlated to a 10% drop in loyalty. So how do we get what we call a sticky experience? Where I went first is where I find resolution. Go to the top right there, next issue avoidance. Turns out your front line know that sometimes a customer is gonna call us back with high certainty. They've seen that story before. What if they were able to forward resolve the next issue a customer had so they didn't have to call you back in a week or two? Wouldn't that just save us a lot of money and actually save the customer a lot of effort? Down to the bottom left there, experience engineering. What we actually find is that the words we choose matter a lot. And what our reps say is not as important as how they say it. So we'll talk about that. And finally, frontline control. In a world where self-service handles all the easy issues, the world of our front line has changed dramatically. It is no longer the world of black and white easy issues. There is much more complexity, and that actually means we have to give our front line a little bit more control to give the customer the low effort experience that they want. So we'll take a look at each of these in turn. We'll start with the channel stickiness idea. So a lot of you guys probably traveled here. I know I did. So how many of you actually bypassed both of the options and checked in online on your phone? I know a lot of us did. I personally chose the kiosk option because I was trying to change my seat and I thought it'd be easier that way. But I can't remember the last time I felt like I had to, had to, that's important, talk to some alive person just to check into a flight. And that really underscores the changes in our world the changes in our world towards the system of being able to do it ourselves and wanting to do it ourselves. People want the control. I want to change my seat. I want to look for an earlier flight. I want to get the upgrade. And I want to know I did it the way I would like to. You know, 
What we actually find, though, is that even though this world has changed, sometimes our perception as service leaders has not. And in fact, we still think customers want to talk to us. So we did some research and found that companies perceived that customers would actually prefer the phone 2.5 times more than the web. The phone is the way you build relationships. The phone is the way to have better experiences. People who talk to us are actually much more loyal than people who don't. But when we actually asked customers and forced them to go through what we call conjoint analysis, which is a way to really understand true preferences, we actually found that customers told us something very different. They said that the, statistically speaking, they did not care if they used the web or the phone, as long as they got resolution. So what we found was that, in fact, sometimes customers don't want to talk to us. I did many focus groups with customers, and they said, it's not like I want to call. It feels like I have to call. And other places make it easy for me to just get done what I need, but I feel like I have to call. So while they're not unhappy, they just feel like, well, why did I have to actually call and talk to somebody if I could have just done it quickly on the go? We find this pattern holds true even for some of the more urgent issues, and actually, interestingly enough, across demographics. Up until the age of 55, people prefer the web and the phone at least equal, if not preferring the web more. So we see a huge age range of people who are very willing to use the website. But we can see that this has changed, has happened very quickly. Just three to five years ago, 66% of customers said, I mainly use the phone. Today, only 28% of the customers we surveyed said the same thing. The shift has been very quick. But what we find is that it's not like our call centers have shut. It's not like our phone volumes have dropped precipitously, right? And a lot of it's because of this data point. We found that 57.7% of your call volume are customers who are just on your website trying to solve the answer, but they couldn't for some reason, so they had to call. So over half of our call volume represents customers who actually just were trying to do something in the faster and cheaper way for us and an easier way for them, but they couldn't. And even more infuriating, actually 35.5 are doing both at once. It's like a race. Let's see what can get the answer quicker. Just think about that. But think about this. This is a call that the customer did not want to make and a call you did not want to take. It is a lose-lose. There are CFOs in the room. They would pretty much be very unhappy to hear that we're paying customers to be more disloyal. So what is the answer here? What is the answer to this problem of people want to go, but for some reason they can't actually fully resolve? Well, what we found through our research is that most people think, hey, let me just add more choices. Customers want more options. They want more functionality. They want more tools. And we actually found that even customers, in voice of the customer surveys, will tell you, I want more choice. But then when faced with actually having to do something with that choice to solve their problem, their demeanor changes immediately. So choice in theory sounds like a great thing. Every voice of the customer study will tell you that. But when you get them in front of a set of choices and ask them to choose, they start to tell you it's way too hard. Just tell me what to do. In fact, there's only 16% of customers in our survey who said, I value, value uh, choice over ease. I got to be in my channel of choice. They some my way or the highway kind of folks. Most of these people are phone users who know your phone number pretty well by now and are doing the thing that they prefer. The rest, the 84%, they value ease over choice. They say, look, I don't care what channel I'm in as long as I get fast resolution. And like I said, this 84%, if we were just to ask them what channel they prefer, they would tell us, they would have a preference. I actually did a focus group and there was a, a young 20-something man and he said, uh, okay, what channel do you like? He said, I like web chat. I love web chat, I love using it. It's really easy, I get to do it during work, super simple. And so we said, okay, well, 
what happens if a company doesn't offer web chat? What then? He said, well, I guess I'd look around and see what else seemed helpful, and I'd do that instead, whatever, else, whatever other answer, place I could find an answer. We said, wait, wait, I, I thought you, you said you had to have web chat. He said, well, I mean, I like web chat, but I just really want the answer to my question. So in a customer preferences survey, he probably would come up as must have web chat, and we might invest in web chat and roll it out, but that customer actually may never use it because all he really wanted was the answer to his problem. And that's the difference between what we call a big P preference and a small P preference. So his big P is get the answer as quickly as possible. And his small P is, I like web chat. So it's, a, it's a something to think about when we think about that customer choice is, are we really optimizing to the 16% and are a lot of the 84% actually masquerading as the 16? So we find that this is true not just in service, but in the world. So Barry Schwartz wrote a really great book, it's worth a read, uh, The Paradox of Choice. What Barry found was that the more choices you give somebody, more choice of jam, for example, is a big one in his book, the less likely people are to be happy with what they purchased, the less confident they are in their choice, and the less likely they are to buy at all. More choice does not lead to more happiness. It actually leads to less happiness sometimes. So what we talk about here is that this, what this really is about is how do we drive simplicity into the service uh, interaction, especially the online and the web interaction. So a tip here, not, not on this page, but I've, you had a chance during the break, what I do is I would Google the FOG index. It's F-O-G index. It's a free tool, it'll pop up. And I would take one of your company's FAQs, one of the top ones, and what you do, stick it into the FOG index, cut and paste. Hit the button, it'll tell you what grade level of reading comprehension is required to understand that FAQ. And you know what you should shoot for? You should shoot for an eighth grade reading level, eight years of education. Um, my research team and I plugged in nearly 100 different companies' FAQs, and you know what average we got? 14. We got 14 as the average of years of education is required to understand company FAQs. We use words that are our own words, our own jargon. We don't use customer words. So what we find is that a very easy way to actually think about simplicity is just think about the FAQs you use and how you can make them more customer friendly. And we also talk a lot about how we guide people through the self-service experience and how we see leading companies really being able to limit choices and show people where to go to resolve the issue the best. Because it turns out we, the company, know where there are better and worse, worse issues to resolve, to resolve issues. So, for example, web chat may not be great for that really complex issue. But if you put your web chat button on every page front and center, people are going to click it, then they'll have to go to the phone, and that's a high effort, high cost experience. Why not just put web chat next to the pages you know? I can solve that in web chat. It would be helpful. Things like that are simple things we can do to help guide a customer and indicate where they should be headed. So that's web stickiness. Let's move on to next issue avoidance. So what is the worst question a rep can ask? I bet you all have your favorite thought here. We think the worst question is, have I fully resolved your issue today? Because we all know that sort of reps speak for, can I get you off the phone so I can get to my next call and hit my ASA and my, and my FCR and my AHT and all my other metrics are going in my head? And the customer says yes, and they get off the phone. They get the nice little survey. Have I fully resolved your issue today? Turns out there are two perspectives on whether or not that happens. Companies tell us that they think 76.7% .7 of contacts and issues are actually resolved in one contact. They say, look, I have really good resolution rates. We ask that question, customers say yes, we click it as resolved. When we ask customers, though, they claim that only 40% of their issues are resolved in one contact. That's a huge disparity, right? Why? Why do we think one thing and the customer thinks something else? The answer is actually not in how do I get better first contact resolution, 
But the better question to ask is, why do my customers call us back? Why do customers actually call back? That broadens your perspective. You suddenly can see more than just a customer saying yes or no at the end of a call. Turns out we found there are two drivers of callbacks. There is, of course, the explicit stuff, right? We just didn't resolve the issue. It's a rep thing, a process thing, a policy thing. Those are the easy fixes, right? But there are also implicit issue failures. This is what happens when the customer even thinks it's resolved at the end and would tell you, but they have to call back for some reason later on down the line. They get the bill and it's not quite right. They don't understand something. Something else happens downstream connected to the first thing. Or they just, they didn't have confidence in that rep. I'm gonna call back and double check. And when you ask customers to break down the reasons for why they called back, we found that it's about half and half. 54% is the explicit, but a huge amount, 46% are due to implicit reasons. Reasons that you will never know by asking a customer, did I resolve your issue? Reasons that are often low hanging fruit because they aren't areas we normally address. And really thinking about these, there's a great story here about what this is. What is this implicit issue? And up here is the, the good old Dyson vacuum. Uh, my colleague Nick Toman owns one. And Nick was telling me a story the other day. Nick was saying, you know, the filter has to get replaced in these things. It's really good, have to replace the filter. So he replaces the filter, but he breaks one of the little plastic mechanisms that holds it in place. So he calls Dyson up and he says, hey, can I get a replacement part? I broke the filter. They're like, oh, that happens a lot. I'm gonna send you two. Nick says, no, I just need one, I'm good. She goes, well, no, 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 I'm gonna send you two because in our experience, we found that it's very hard to work that mechanism and people tend to break the first one. And then we have to send them another one. I'm gonna send you two just to be totally sure, on us, no worries, all at once. And Nick gets the box, he opens it up, he says, I'm definitely not gonna break this, I'm gonna show him. And of course, he does break the first one. <laughs> so, he is the second one, no problem. But that's a classic example of next issue avoidance. That rep knew people call back because they broke the first piece and they have to actually get the second. That's a whole other week of waiting, not being able to vacuum, all that kind of stuff. So what do they do? For minimal charge to the company, they throw in another plastic piece. They say, I know the second time you'll get it right. It's a great example of a rep that said, I'm gonna take ownership over this, and I'm gonna show that we can get this done for you, you won't have to contact us again. So next issue, avoidance in action. Companies are great at being able to actually bucket these issues together and help their reps understand what should I resolve next. All right, so that's the next issue, avoidance. Another thing your frontline reps do is, it's actually called, we call it experience engineering. And it's no, it's no secret that three of these things here, anything, everything except for channel stickiness, is about your frontline. And it's about live interactions. And it's because of something that we actually found here. We started to understand and wonder what actually drives customer effort. What causes a customer at the end of an interaction to say that was easy? What we found is that only one third of effort is driven by what customers have to do. The steps, the actions being transferred, repeating themselves, objective stuff, you can click off on a box. But two thirds of effort is driven by how they felt, how the rep made them feel. Two thirds is driven by how they perceived the interaction. So it turns out that you know, our issues may be complex. Our processes may be in need of a little bit of an update. Our systems may not be where we want them to be. But our front line have a huge impact in how our customers are perceiving effort today. So the do side is important. It is one third, but those are long projects. The feel side is what you can do today to help your customers feel like it's a low effort experience. And you know, it's not about deceiving the customer, but it is about how we position things for people because they need to be okay with the answer and the solution that we can give them at the end of the day. And the best way you can do that is through words. This is all rooted in behavioral economics and how to influence people and influencing words. 
For example, advocacy. If I as a rep say, look, I'm gonna take a position of support on behalf of you. I'm working with you to find an answer for you. That actually decreases customer effort by 77%. My favorite is positive language. By leading with what we can do instead of what we can't do, that is positive language. What I can do for you today is not leading with, well, we can't do what you want. That reduces customer effort by 73%. One company simply took the top 10 times they have to say no to a customer, and they asked their reps to change that negative language into positive language, and they just post it up on everyone's cubicle, do role plays on it, and they saw a 50% decrease in escalations. A 50% decrease in escalations because people were like, can I speak to your manager because no is not the answer I want today. So lang positive language can have a huge impact. Anchoring. Anchoring is how we actually position and how we uh, kind of present options. If you present option, the first option you present is always the option people will anchor against. So if I just said the word, if I said 100 right now, and then asks you to estimate how many countries there are in the world, you'll anchor off that 100. The same is true with solutions. People anchor off of what you say, so by positioning solutions appropriately, you can actually reduce effort by 55%. What we find with experience engineering is that your frontline don't need to be you know, armchair psychologists or have a background in sociology or behavioral economics. What we should do is offer them the frameworks and the tools to be able to do this. It's simple things, easy things like that, top 10 list, et cetera, to get some of the way there. So that is experience engineering. And we actually found some very interesting things with experience engineering recently. It's not in this presentation because we just found this out, but what we actually found is that over half of the interaction outcome is actually driven by what happened before the interaction for customers. So what customers come in with, their perceptions, their experiences, really colors their interaction and their perception of the interaction. We call that customer baggage, just like emotional baggage, things you bring into interactions. Customers do too, they're not blank slates. But reps are afraid to touch that. They feel, why, why do I want to bring up the past? I see they called a lot, but I don't want to bring that up. It turns out that customers do want you to bring it up because they want you to acknowledge that they are a person who has had a relationship with you before and they want that, that, that you know me kind of feeling. The best reps who do that, who acknowledge it and quickly move on to own that customer's issue have a huge impact on the customer's perception of that interaction. And so what we do find is that customers are asking just to be treated like human beings and to have a one-to-one -one interaction with somebody who's going to do their best to help them and work together to find a solution. And that really leads me to the last section here, this frontline control. Like I said, the world is changing. The old world was one in which we saw a pretty even mix of complexity and volume of calls, right? You get some easy ones, some medium ones, some hard ones. It was one channel, the phone. It was simple, it was check my balance, check my balance, check my balance, lots of simple stuff. And there is information asymmetry. We had the information, the customer didn't. But as self-service has risen, what we find is that live contacts have changed dramatically. They've shifted to the right, and they've gone down. So slightly lower volume, but higher complexity. When the easy stuff goes to self-service, the remaining mix is more complex. We live in a multi-channel world. Things are complex and varied, and there's actually information parity. Our customers know just as much, if not sometimes more, than what our reps know. In this world, what we find is that, that reps are telling us that there are no black and white answers anymore. Increasingly, there's only gray. And what they find is that they have to use their judgment to solve customer issues. They can't just rely on the book. They can't just rely on the processes. But sometimes they have to step outside of those. And what we found that that requires to be successful is that we have to actually get out with the old and in with the new. 
So the past world was one where reps were pretty much a factory floor model. We were focusing on getting you know, people in seats. It's churn and burn. Very rote training, scripted resolution for the most part, just a checklist on internal quality metrics. I said the customer's name three times, et cetera. An emphasis on efficiency, handle time, all those metrics. Let's go through the queue. But in a world where things are more complex and gray, where customers want tailored resolution, where reps have to exercise judgment, this model simply is starting to not work anymore. And in fact, I, have some, I just recently saw some data from one of our surveys that showed that our frontline reps are actually beginning to chafe against this. What we found is that frontline rep satisfaction with their job has dropped off precipitously in the last year and a half. It usually tracks with the rest of the employees' happiness with their jobs. It tracks. It's a little bit lower, but it tracks. The last two years, it's diverged. Frontline staff are increasingly unhappy with their job because they're in a world that's much more complex and different. And a lot of them tell us they don't feel equipped to handle it. So what does the new world look like? Reps, we believe, are going to be much more like knowledge workers. If our reps are at the front line with our customers every day, if they are a key touch point in the customer experience, they are so important that we have to start thinking of them as that key touch point. And that means a very different talent management model. It means that we have to look for different kinds of candidates, maybe ones that value you know, risk-taking or independence, people who actually would like to step outside of the box and help the customer, but know how to balance it with the, with the company needs. A focus on coaching. How do I individually help you get better at the stuff you're already good at? Tailored resolution. Customer assess quality. And focus on effectiveness. A big one here on effectiveness over efficiency. What we found is that many of your peers are saying, no longer are we going to focus on average handle time. What we want to look at is the total cost per call. Be or, sorry, the total cost per contact. Because if I have one really short call, but they call three times, that total cost to resolve is way higher than if I took one call for slightly longer and fully resolved their issue. So many companies are saying, how do I measure that instead? How do I take a broader view? How do I help my front line be able to take the control they need to be able to deliver these low effort experiences? So you can see a world that really we believe is changing for the front line, for the service organization, for the contact center. As you think about the low effort experience, we see so many things changing. And as you start your journey on low effort, you think about those four pillars. There's one thing I'll, I'll leave you with, and that's really thinking a little bit about how to get started. We think the first way to get started, and there, we think there are three big challenges peers tend to have with low effort. One is, how much effort am I causing right now? Two is, how do I manage a multi-channel, complex, and costly experience? And three, how do I equip my front line to handle the, this new world? Starting with one, measurement. We do uh, believe there's a great question you can ask. You can just simply ask the customer, how much effort did you have to put forth in this last service interaction? We can see the question here. The company made it easy for me to handle my issue on a scale. And it's highly predictive of future loyal, disloyalty, loyalty, and also net promoter. So what we'd say is net promoter is a great way to measure the overall relationship. And effort tells us the part service plays. Those who have lower effort scores on the, from the customer effort score see a very large change in their NPS overall. So it's a great contribution. So it's a great first way to measure it, to take a look at it. Of course, it is just you know, one metric. And you probably want to look at other things to understand the drivers behind those. But it's a great first indicator of how much effort your customers are facing. And I'll just leave you with this. Certainly, if you want a copy of the presentation, it's online. We can certainly share that with you. But I'll just leave you with this thought that, in general, what we see is that this is a moment in service that has a great potential 
for all of us. Service is increasingly a differentiator for the company as products and prices become more commoditized. And we now know how to seize that opportunity. We now know what we need to do to be able to win the new loyalty game. And it's all about reducing effort and making it easy for our customers. Thank you very much.